Every Wednesday, William Henry's Revelations bring you a powerful half hour of information at the cutting edge of reality. Information that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. And now, here's William. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are joined by frequent Revelations guest Jay Widener, who Wired Magazine called an authority on the hermetic and alchemical traditions and erudite conspiracy hunter. Jay is a renowned author, filmmaker, and hermetic scholar. With so much going on in the world, we had to give him a ring. Jay, welcome to Revelations. Hey, William. How are you doing? Ah, doing great. Thank you. Good. So, lots to talk about, Jay. You know, yeah. I just want to say that after we booked our interview, I caught a minute or two of David Icke talking with Alex Jones, and David ventured into the subject of the Archons and the Gnostics, essentially saying that all of the chaos, crisis, turmoil in our world wow. is the work of the Archons. And I'm thinking, ah, right. <laughs> I want to talk with Jay, about someone, talk with someone who's actually read the Hermetic works, who knows the Gnostic text, who can talk about the Archons in great detail. What do you think? Well, I, first off, I didn't know that, and uh, I'm gratified because I've been working on David for about four years now, and uh, that's a major switch, and that's really good news. So um, I, you know, I, I, I've, been, I've been focusing more and more on, on these guys, these critters, and um, I think I'm starting to snag them, uh, and I think I'm getting very, very close to the whole thing and understanding it. My only hope is that every is that I live through it because everybody else who gets as close as I'm getting seems to disappear, uh, including Mac Tonys, who wrote a, a book called Crypto Terrestrials, mm -hmm. uh, who died before it was published. And of course, we know about Phil in his Snyder. 30s. Pardon me. He's only in his 30s. Yes, uh, mid 30s, and he died in his sleep. Uh, before the book was published, which is really unfortunate because I've read all of his books now and we lost a good one there. And, uh, of course, Phil Schneider, but there are others. Um, I picked up a relationship with Anthony Sanchez, whose uh, face was half paralyzed by an archon uh, who poisoned him in a, at a restaurant in Dulce. And um, uh, we're starting to identify the archons that are among us. So I'm doing a lecture at a UFO conference in uh, June called the Crypto Terrestrials Among Us because I've taken up Mac Tony's name for them because it seems to explain it better than Archons. But basically, I think this is a group that has been here on the planet with us uh, since the beginning. They're our cousins. They um, did not lose their technology in a catastrophe. They have kept it. And uh, they uh, are our slave masters, and they manipulate us. And they have uh, psychic abilities that we do not have, or ours have atrophied, maybe on purpose. And um, they have been using us for thousands of years. And the human race, the Gnostics, the ancient Gnostics, who have all died, that's another group that seems to have disappeared as soon as they begin talking about these people, these creatures, these critters, of uh, the ancient Gnostics left behind, I believe, left behind the Nag Hammadi, buried them in the clay jars in Egypt in the cave on purpose to be found in, in, in the modern times. And what we have when we read the Nag Hammadi is, you know, an unblemished account. Uh, no pope, no governor, no king has, has gone in and rewritten them. And it took great pains to even get them translated and out, as you probably know, William. Mm -hmm. And, boy, when we read them, we read of a world that is completely different than the one that we were taught about. And uh, there's a great warning in the Nag Hammadi about these archons and that they walk among us and that they, they like to have sex with us. They like to... Um, do things to us, and they like they like wars, and they like violence, and they they like to um, screw with our heads. And I think if you look through history, you'll see that <clears throat> that is the history of our race. Is every time that the human race starts getting it together, something comes in and causes a malfunction. Uh, the Bible tells us about the Tower of Babel when the entire human race is united and um, building a tower and uh, speaking one language and there's no wars and all is peace and Jehovah doesn't like it and uh, destroys the human race by 
planting many, many languages and creating disunity. And that's the story of the archons. That's what the archons do to us. They, they, they don't like us. They don't want to make sure we stay stupefied, and we just do what we're told, which is basically, um, basically they've set up the entire system. They've set up the banking system. They've set up civilization itself. They created cities, all in an effort uh, for us to serve their needs, and they live here among us. And I remember... John Lan, excuse me, John Lamb Lash, and his yeah. observations, and not in his image about the archons, and saying he equates them with the Greys. Yeah, do you? I do. I, I mean, at first, I, I found that idea kind of silly, but I tell you, I started going down the same roads that John had went down before me, and I, I don't think the Greys are the, are the archons. I think the Greys are some kind of machine thing or something, cyber or possibly bio thing that they have made um, that they use as a uh, as one of their little tricks and um, I mean there's some you know, hair raising stories as you know about all of this and I think we're zeroing in on them and, and Anthony Sanchez is a very interesting guy he got close to the nest in, in, in Dulce and um, at the Apache Indian Reservation there just a few months ago and um, you know he got he was at a restaurant um, a small restaurant with only two waitresses um, in the middle of a nowhere place in New Mexico, and um, uh, a mysterious, strange woman served him his breakfast, who no one had ever seen before or since. She looked Eurasian, according to his description, which is a description that could be said of these creatures. And um, uh, he got uh, uh, it was a neurotoxin was in the food, and he almost died. And uh, uh, so every time you get, and this is where Phil Schneider, of course, was speaking about, was Dulce, and there's a nest of them there. And uh, it's pretty obvious when you start looking into it, what's going on here? And it changes everything that you, you know, even the most skeptical part of you has to at some point say, you know, if there's this much smoke, there has to be a fire. And I think there is a fire, and I think it's these crypto-terrestrial archons, and they've been there the whole time, and they're still there. And and one of the kind of the, I don't know, path the tra- trajectory once you, you get into the study of the archons is you get into the kind of the Robert Monroe take on it that yeah. they're harvesting an energy substance from us. He called it louche. Do you mm-hmm. still subscribe to that, or what is their other motivation? Well, I mean, the first motivation is just survival, and they don't want to work. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I think that's actually a very basic. When I go through and I read the ancient mythologies, uh, humans are always having to take their crops and put it, you know, mm. next to a cave opening or next, on a mountaintop, and you know, sacrificing for the gods or animals, and and and, and, the, and the food literally disappears. Something takes it, right? Um, and that's what we've been doing the whole time when we're giving our food to them, and and. And uh, everything, and so that's the first level of the manipulation. But the but the larger level is a um, a bizarre um, uh, attraction to watching us fight and, and kill each other. Mm-hmm. And they they really have a almost a sexual uh, thing about it, and they really like it. And they they kind of come in like moths to a flame to any kind of violence and war, and they in have a have a way of like getting into people and turning them into even more violent and uh, you know mob or demos or democracy all these words describe this kind of mob action that happens and I think these are controlled by by what some people would call demonic uh, but I'm more now considering it as the archons and their psychic uh, powers that they use against us and that sounds really kind of wacky but if you start getting into this and uncovering it, um, you find a, a stunning similarity in stories from mythologies all the way up to alien abductions today. Well, and and the other thing that is starting to come into focus too, Jay, is the advent of technology and the, the archon's use of imitation, and we're starting to recognize the kind of the, the the simulated reality theory that this is possible that we're all living in some kind of holographic projection that might even been might even have been created by the archons. Um, I'm afraid that that is uh, what I have come to the conclusion that we are living in this 
and but we're beginning to break free of it right now. That's what's going on. It's a rebellion like, against the archons. It is. It is a, it's an archon rebellion, and um, they're. I know it sounds crazy, but you know people are actually starting to identify them. In other words, there's archons that walk among us. And we're beginning to figure out what they look like and everything. Mm. And they're incredibly, not only do they have a certain look, but they run all these major corporations. <laughs> and uh, it's like, whoa, where, you know, what is going on here? And, and, so what do they look like, Jay? Well, they have, a, if, if, you, if you go to Amazon.com and type in, you know, for the book Crypto Terrestrials by Mac Tone, there's this haunting cover to the book. Yeah. Which really shows what they look like and even shows the strange psoriasis that they have because they can't go out in the sun. And so their skin has a, a strange scaly quality, which is where the, I think the reptilian stories are coming uh-huh. from, which I've been trying to get Ike to listen to me on. Right. And I think he is. David! David! <laughs> David! Hello! Come in, David! <laughs> He's getting his it. Attention. And uh, he's doing some great work on Saturn and the Moon. So, um, well, that's but, you know, I want to talk about that too because we're yeah. going to talk in the second part of our interview about uh, our, one of your favorite subjects and a subject I love talking with you about. That's Stanley Kubrick. But let's save that for uh, sure. a moment. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, and this is my interest in the uh, kind of angle I'm pursuing the, the whole Archon story from is yeah. These, I'm very interested in the light body, the rainbow body, the yeah. robe of light, the robe of glory. They also call it the perfect light. And in the Gnostic text, I mean, they make it clear that the only way to evade these powers, as they're referred to, is to clothe ourselves in that perfect light because they're not going to be able to see you, nor will they be able to detain you. You know, me, I just got to tell you, that is, uh, I am like really glad you brought that up because I have a motion picture, a commercial film coming out in the next three months, and it's called Shasta, and oh. it's about the return of Kalki. You know who Kalki is? Yes, Kalki, the Kalki re- avatar. Yeah, Kalki is the 10th avatar of Vishnu, and this is movie is about the return of Kalki. And what he does, I'll sneak preview, folks, what he does is he takes over all of the uh, television networks and satellites and computers all over the world, and for 15 minutes, he shows and describes exactly what you just said and wow. destroys the Illuminati and the Archons in one That's the answer, story. isn't it, Jay? <laughs> That's the only response. Yeah, I had to ask myself while doing the movie, what would Kalki do if he came here today? How would he nonviolently destroy the Illuminati and, and the Archons? What would he do? And the answer is, all you really have to do is teach us about the light body. Show us completely. And with today's special effects, well... Exactly. We can do it. Exactly. And then it's because it's, I mean, from what I understand about it, it is a transmittable vibration. I'm thinking, why? And this is where you're obviously coming in, Jay. Why isn't someone with used Hollywood special effects to show this, to take people into the temples, the movie theater, put them in a beautiful environment, and let them feel that vibration coming off the screen? It's, uh, I'm the first to announce that it's going, it's happening. And it will be out, uh, September is the release. Um, and uh, I'm releasing it in theaters, and it's it has um, Alex Polinsky from uh, Charles in Charge, old TV show. He's the actor who plays Kalki, and Neil Donald Walsh plays Count St. Germain. And oh my God. It's, yeah, That's it's incredible. It's, it's, okay. Congratulations, Jay. I can't wait to see that. Uh, that I'll, send, I'll definitely get you a copy as fast as I can get it. Oh, please. But special oh, effects are being done now. The light body effects actually are being done right now by a crew out of uh, Amsterdam, and they're just completely uh, going gaga over the whole idea that they're going to be able to do this. And, oh, uh, my gosh. Well, that this is, yeah, this has to be done. It's so just absolutely cool that you're doing it. So, Jay, we've we got to take a quick break. When we come back, let's talk about your new Stanley Kubrick film. Sounds this good. is Revelations. We'll be right back. May 18th to 20th. A solar eclipse, a great deal expected to happen, and one of the most extraordinary things that's going to happen is the Dreamland Festival at the Scarrett Bennett Center in Nashville. 
Nick Pope will be for the first time telling us about one of the most incredible UFO encounters ever that's been kept secret by the British Ministry of Defense until just recently. Nick was the lead investigator. Linda Moulton Howe will be taking us back to the mystery of Gobekli Tepe, 9,000 years old. Who built it? How did they do it? An incredible, incredible story. Don't miss it. Jim Mars, the occulting of America. What is happening to us? What's really happening behind the scenes? Marla Fries with one of her astonishing readings, cold readings of the audience, one of the few psychics who can do that, really do it. And of course, me and Ann Streeper. Here's William to tell you about his presentation. Hey everybody, this is William Henry. I'm looking very much forward to everybody coming to Nashville in May. I'm going to be doing my presentation called The Kit. It's time to put the pieces together. In this presentation, I reveal evidence of a supernatural and miraculous device called the kit that was used by the most ancient and advanced aliens and avatars to transform humans into light beings and open gateways to the stars. It is an astonishing story, and I can't wait to share it with you. Go to unknowncountry.com, click on the Dreamland Festival sales point on the right, get your tickets today. This is Revelations. We're continuing with Jay Widener. So, Jay, I recently spoke with Sean David Morton on Revelations. He was talking about 2012, and he went right for the red-hot analogy about the 2012 moment, which was the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey, the birth of the star child, saying this is what 2012 is about. It's about this moment of we're in the gestation period now, and ultimately it's going to be a shift in consciousness like you saw at the end of that movie. And I'm thinking, well, that's a really cool analogy, and I can't wait to talk with Jay about that. Well, that's funny you say that, because my other new movie, which is actually is out now, is uh, the sequel to Kubrick's Odyssey. It's called uh, Se- uh, Beyond the Infinite, Kubrick's mm-hmm. Odyssey 2, and it's all about that, what you just described. It's about how Kubrick knew, because he hung out with the elites, and they were they were afraid of this coming enlightenment, and were trying to, of course, control it, and Kubrick, that, that kind of, you know, angered him, I think, in a way. And so he used the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was really funded by the Pentagon and NASA, to um, slip in this entire alchemical story of, of, um, of enlightenment, how we as a race become enlightened. And he, he, he planted it like a bombshell inside the baby boomer generation. And as a person whose first religious experience was when I was 15 years old uh, watching 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, I can tell you that film overwhelmed my generation. And uh, uh, we walked around stunned for months after that film came out, uh, as if we'd seen something that, you know, was impossible. And what Stanley did was he buried the entire symbolically he buried the entire path of initiation of the human race into the film and taught us how to do it by doing it in the way that he did and in a way kind of created us and changed us into uh more more of a shamanic generation more seeking this kind of shamanic release, which is what the movie is actually saying. So that's in my new movie, and it's all there. The 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 um, the monolith is a black monolith. It's a stone. It's a monolith, which means a single stone. It's black. It transmutes humanity every time it enters into the scene. Uh, it's really the movie is about the monolith. The screen. 2001 is shown on the Cinerama screen at the time is exactly the same dimensions as the monolith because Kubrick's film is the black stone that changes humanity. Which is amazing. The film itself. And he knew that this change was going to happen around the time of the galactic alignment, which is why he has the the galaxy and the light show scene, um, which was actually 1990. Nine, two thousand, the sloppy. It's in there somewhere around two thousand one. But he may have also known that the Illuminati was planning something. 
I have evidence that he knew that the Illuminati was planning something momentous in 2001, and I think he made the film also to get ahead of that so that we were already on the path to enlightenment before they did their dastardly deed. Mm. Yeah, but it's a, interesting. But, you know, reading the hypertext here, too, and you're thinking 2001, you've got the the 9-11 memorial that yeah. is very Kubrick-esque with its black cube symbolism. In fact, there's two cubes in black cubes in the 9-11 memorial, and you you just wonder, you know, are, yeah. are, are they're using this symbolism intentionally. It seems obvious. Oh, yeah, well, the hotel is not a hotel. It's a building. I think it's World Trade Center 2, not 2, 5, I think. It didn't go down. It got heavily damaged. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a black model. I mean, just look at the building. It's like, whoa, the same dimension to everything. So, you know, World Trade Center has a black model in it before it went down. <laughs> so, right. Um, so, so, Jay, this is your second or third film about Cuba? This is the second. And the this third the one second. will be coming out. Uh, I'm putting one out a year, so next year. And I remember when we talked last about Kubrick's Odyssey, the family was kind of not quite sure about your story. Oh no, no, there's, there there is no family. Um, oh no, uh, uh, Vivian uh, got taken by the Scientologists in 1995, hmm. and she didn't even come home for the funerals of either her sister or her father. Wow. And um, which I think is interesting because Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are Scientologists. It makes you wonder what was going on. And um, also, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Christiana Kubrick, um, it is rumored, is uh, very upset about the way she's being treated by everybody and is a big fan of mine. So tell Fantastic. me. Fantastic. Okay, good. <laughs> I couldn't remember... Well, uh, I mean, I, I was, I, I, I wondered if they were going to sue me. That's what it was. But um, I don't think it's been a year now, and uh, there hasn't been a peep. I, I don't think that's in the cards. I don't think. Good. You know, yeah. I was just in Egypt, and I had a conversation about Hollywood with my guide, and he was saying that all many Egyptians really know about America is what they learn from TV shows and movies, and they think that what they see on TV is the way the average American is. Yeah. It's a you know, kind of a simple point, but really powerful nonetheless. We we really do forget how powerful Hollywood movies, in particular, are in their ability to make our world. Yes, I really agree with that, and that's one of the reasons I'm gotten into feature filmmaking because I'm I'm doing a, a guerrilla action uh, around uh, uh, Hollywood is going broke right now. Uh, the whole system is falling apart, and they're just just really not in, in, in any kind of a good place. So, you know, I've decided that uh, I can make my films away from Hollywood, low budget and uh, still high quality, and show a different kind of world than the one that we're getting. And maybe people in other countries even can watch a film like Shasta and say, wow, I had no idea, you know, there was this kind of stuff going on also in America. Another subject that I, I want to come back to, uh, Jay, is you recently did a uh, an interview with Anthony Sanchez about the Archons and Skynet, talking about movies and the power of movies and yeah. the, the way they're they're prophecies, really, aren't they? They're kind of telling us, especially in the in the Skynet movie, that we're going to have this, or, or the Terminator movie, that we're going to have this artificially intelligent being that essentially decides they really don't want us around, and we're we're really right on the verge of that, aren't we? Well, that's why I say the hardest problem the human race faces is the Archon problem. And until we get a handle on it, we're not going to have any kind of enlightenment, no matter how many guerrilla actions we do with movies and stuff. But um, So it's like we have to wake up to that problem. We have to wake up to the fact that there's like nests all over the place of these cr- creatures, and they're like way ahead of us. And they've created the whole system. And... Um, and we have to uh, find a way to get around that problem or we're not going to make it. And uh, that's the only thing left to do now, I think, is to try to get a handle on what these guys are doing to us and how we can avoid them in a nonviolent way. I personally believe it's through the light body and the teaching of the light body. And I think I can see a kind of a concrescence going on where several different people and things are all kind of reaching the same you know, um, decision about that. And uh, so that's uh, about the only thing that can save us is a transcendence, like water boiling in, on a pan on, in the stove. 
you know, the water transcends the situation by turning into steam. And I think that what's happening here is that the idea of the light body is going to get out co-current with the secret of alchemy through the book of Aquarius. And I think together that's going to um, do in all the, the uh the uh, enemies of truth, as uh, as the Vedic text calls them. I'm glad you brought up the Book of Aquarius. We, that was the topic of our last conversation. I got a lot of email about that. People were kind of upset when they found out what the main ingredient was. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, mean, I don't know why I should upset them, but um, nevertheless, I can tell you that uh, I have other knowledge from other alchemical texts which verifies it. And so I, that's, you know, getting it from two or three sources that are cross-cultural, one being Chinese, one being Indian, and one being European alchemy uh, from different time periods, all pointing towards the same thing, makes me think that it has to be that. Well, I, and I agree with you, Jay. I mean, the, the ingredient we're talking about, guys, is urine, Thank you. and the, the kind of the... the mental leap you have to make, and this is kind of the gap I feel that is put before people as they make this study, is they, they simply believe that the human body itself is just vile, filthy, disgusting. It's that yeah. Judeo-Christian perspective that we're all sinful. We're just yeah. garbage, basically. And that's kind of an archonic perspective, isn't it? It certainly and to, is. It's and, and, and you archonic. have to overcome that and realize, wait a minute, no, actually my body is a holy vessel. Absolutely. And it's capable of manufacturing these substances. I and mean, that's something I really uh, always uh, remember learning from you, Jay, is the, the possibility of the body as to, to create these enlightenment substances. They, they do. And, uh, you know, I, all you have to do is just look at the chemistry of the human body and the chemistry of what makes dreams and visions, and which is really opening up the... Um, the Shashumna, which is the tunnel that leads out of the top of our head up into to, to the overmind or to the Gaian mind, if you will, and uh, that the, the so we're tethered to the Gaian mind, which is its own hypersphere that surrounds the Earth. We're like each human, each living thing is like at the very long tip of a vortex of light, like a tornado of light that's so small you could never see it, but it's there anyway. And right where it touches the ground, right before it where it touches the earth, it creates life. And we're what is between that tethered called the Shashumna and the solid ground. And that's what all life is. And once you understand that, then you understand that that means that you can tap off of this endless source and uh it, it, and and then that give that self empowers you and then all you need is a long life which you get via the philosopher's stone mm-hmm. uh to give you a long enough time to work out the things that have to be worked out in order for you to achieve the light body and if you don't need to eat and you don't need to uh any nu- nutrition because of the philosopher's stone then it makes sense that you're now in a different place and uh you're spending your time pursuing things that you would never pursue in this kind of world that we live in right now. Getting back to Stanley Kubrick, how much of this did he know, and how much of it did he actually live, do you think? Oh, I think he knew a lot, but he was always on the outside. But he was smart enough. He had a 200 IQ as a top chess champion. I think he was smart enough to just sit there listening and to figure it out without having to say too much. And uh, because he's, you got to look at who he's hanging out with, right? And, and you know, there are no slouches. You know, Arthur C. Clarke and Fred Ordway and Carl Sagan and um, all these people are coming over to London and, and hanging out with him. Uh, um, Werner von Braun and uh, all the other German scientists that were coming through London via Arthur C. Clarke's apartment. Uh, all, uh, this was all going on like a stew, and he he had to know. I mean, if we know what we know... Then, you know, and his movies are all about it. If you think about it, 2001, he says it's some kind of off planet force that's ruling us secretly. In The Shining, it's a demonic or, or ghost kind of spirits that are ruling us. And in Eyes Wide Shut, it's, you know, um, secret societies. So I think it's kind of all of the above. Jay, we've just got a couple minutes left here. Tell us how, uh, when we can get. Uh, the new video, Kubrick's Odyssey, and uh, excuse me, Kubrick's Odyssey Two, 
yeah. and how they can connect with uh, the events that you're going to be participating in. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be at Conspiracy Con uh, in Santa Clara, California in June, and I'm going to be at a UFO convention uh, a couple weeks later in Sacramento. I'll have that up on my site soon. That's Anthony Sanchez's event. And then um, you can get Kubrick's Odyssey 2. You can either get it at sacredmysteries.com. I think you can order on Amazon, and um, it'll be it, it, it'll be out in, like, the next week. Uh, you can just order it, and the DVDs will be arriving. I'll send you a copy. And um, Shasta will be out in September. Gosh, can't wait for Shasta. That's perfectly timed for 2012, too, isn't it, for <laughs> December? <laughs> yes. Wow. Well, wonderful. Well, again, congratulations, Jay. Can't wait yeah. to, to see all of this when it when it comes available. Yeah, well, so, thanks, Henry, for your time. It's really great to be on your show. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime, Jay. We'll right, look yeah. forward to catching up with you again soon. Yeah. This has been Revelations. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Attending a William Henry presentation is unforgettable. Keep up with his schedule at williamhenry.net. You've been listening to William Henry's Revelations on Dreamland Radio. Next Wednesday, another cutting-edge revelation from William Henry. But basically, I think this is a group that has been here on the planet with us uh, since the beginning. They're our cousins. They um, did not lose their technology in a catastrophe. They have kept it. And uh, they uh, are our slave masters, and they manipulate us. And they have uh, psychic abilities that we do not have, or ours have atrophied, maybe on purpose. And um, they have been using us for thousands of years. And the human race, the Gnostics, the ancient Gnostics, who have all died, that's another good news. So um, I, you know, I, I, I've been... I've been focusing more and more on on these guys, these critters, and um, I think I'm starting to snag them, uh, and I think I'm getting very, very close to the whole thing and understanding it. My only hope is that every is that I live through it because everybody else who gets as close as I'm getting seems to disappear, uh, including Mac Tonys, who wrote a, a book called Crypto Terrestrials. Uh, who died before it was published, and of course, you know about Phil in his Snyder. 30s. Pardon me? He's only in his 30s. Yes, uh, mid 30s, and he died in his. Every Wednesday, William Henry's Revelations bring you a powerful half hour of information at the cutting edge of reality. Information that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. And now, here's William. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are joined by frequent Revelations guest Jay Widener, who Wired Magazine called an authority on the hermetic and alchemical traditions and erudite conspiracy hunter. Jay is a renowned author, filmmaker, and hermetic scholar. With so much going on in the world, we had to give him a ring. Jay, welcome to Revelations. Hey, William. How you doing? Ah, doing great. Thank you. Good. So, lots to talk about, Jay. You know, yeah. I just want to say that after we booked our interview, I caught a minute or two of David Icke talking with Alex Jones, and David ventured into the subject of the archons and the Gnostics, essentially saying that all of the chaos, crisis, turmoil in our world wow. is the work of the archons. And I'm thinking, ah, right. <laughs> I want to talk with Jay, about someone, talk with someone who's actually read the Hermetic works, who knows the Gnostic text, who can talk about the archons in great detail. What do you think? Well, I, first off, I didn't know that, and uh, I'm gratified because I've been working on David for about four years now, and uh, that's a major switch, and that's really good sleep uh, before the book was published, which is really unfortunate because I've read all of his books now, and we lost a good one there. And, uh, of course, Phil Schneider, but there are others. Um, I picked up a relationship with Anthony Sanchez, whose uh, face was half-paralyzed, by an archon uh, who poisoned him in a, at a restaurant in Dulce. And um, uh, we're starting to identify the archons that are among us. So I'm doing a lecture at a UFO conference in uh, June called the Crypto Terrestrials Among Us because I've taken up Mactoni's name for them because it seems to explain it better than archons. 